Welcome to Chatsunami. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Chatsunami. My name's Satsunami and joining me atop the moon to fish is none other than my very good friend Andrew. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good. The sun is finally shining over here. Winter seems to be at an end and I'm going to discuss a film studio that is very close to my heart, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I have to say this is definitely a topic long in the discussion, isn't it, between us? Yeah, we've been talking about watching or other discussing this for quite some time, so it's good that we're, we're finally getting to it. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, we could absolutely do a month on this particular topic we're going to be talking about today, but, you know, never say never, but today we are indeed going to be talking about the animation studio DreamWorks and I've got to say it is definitely a weird one because we were talking before we came on today and it's quite a hard one to pinpoint for ourselves because we were discussing essentially what was the first exposure what was the patient zero of films to actually get us into these films but do you remember for yourself Andrew? I think I do so my family was very interested in the film The Prince of Egypt. We had a lot of sort of inside jokes and references to that movie. And I I remember very distinctly my brother, who's six years older than me, his 12th birthday, my older sisters signed a a card, who they are also older than him, signed a card saying, uh, you're playing with the big boys now, which is of course a reference to The Prince of Egypt. And that was, that's a very kind of distinct memory I have from when I was five turning six. So that I think was my first kind of introduction to DreamWorks Studios. And of course I did watch the likes of Shrek growing up and I did watch Ants and, and The Road to El Dorado and various other films but The Prince of Egypt was very fundamental in my childhood and it's one that I love to come back to each time. Yeah I honestly have no idea what Minds was in particular because I always remember Ants and you probably remember this as well but when Ants came out there was another small indie studio you might have heard of, a very small animation studio called Disney who decided <laughs> to release a similar and I'm emphasizing this a very similar film called A Bug's Life at the same time and the reason for this and this is something we will get into but of course DreamWorks was a company that was established from ironically enough an ex-employee of Disney called Jeffrey Katzenberg and honest to goodness I cannot believe the people involved in establishing this company and I was saying that to you but you know you've got Jeffrey Katzenberg you've got Steven Spielberg and then you've also got David Geffen who I think originally it was called DreamWorks SKG to, you know, represent all of their surnames. The fact that people weren't really challenging Disney. Before I go back and, you know, talk about what was my first experience, do you remember many animation studios taking on Disney at the time? There certainly weren't many. Like Universal Pictures or the Universal Studios did have an animation wing and I think Fox Animation had an animation wing as well. You did have the likes of All Dogs Go to Heaven, Balto, Anastasia. Like those, there were movies coming out around that time that were kind of trying to compete with Disney, but very few would be able to kind of hold up to what Disney was doing, especially in the 90s when Disney was having its real kind of renaissance of very strong films that were such a cultural touchstone like there was so much re- like resonance with the world with the likes of Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Lion King, Tarzan, Mulan, uh, even Hercules. These films were so impactful to a generation of children that very few others were able to kind of get through and stand out until I would say the new millennium when Disney started not doing as well certainly at the beginning of the new millennium. So there were studios competing but they just weren't able to sort of hold up to the same kind of standard, I don't think. Coming from someone who studied history like you and I, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, Anastasia's not like a household name, but you know, you wouldn't hold that kind of film or Balto or you know, any of those kind of films to the same high standard as like Aladdin or Mulan or you know, all of the Disney Renaissance films that came out at the time. So the fact that DreamWorks came along and just rocked the boat completely was, I mean, obviously we were kids at the time so it wasn't really shocking to us you know we were just like oh 
the new films, yeah. But it is actually shocking to think that they just came around and they were like, oh, we're going to come in and just, yeah, establish ourselves. Almost a bit like what Illumination's done in recent years, like maybe over the last decade or so, with their Despicable Me and Secret Life of Pets, you know, you know all the ones. Yeah, I would say Illumination seems to be the new kind of DreamWorks in that regard. I think Sony Animation is also trying to kind of get a foothold and also Netflix Animation is trying to kind of get a foothold in that. But I would say Illumination seems to be the most successful of the new era. Because, I mean, considering they've got their foothold in the Mario Brothers film right now, it's absolutely insane to think because a lot of people were saying, oh, they're not, you know, very good for the role and everything. And, you know, that'll obviously be another episode for another day. But it is amazing how studios nowadays are just coming up a lot easier and being able to challenge big companies like Disney and DreamWorks. And don't get me wrong, those companies probably, and please don't quote me on this if I'm completely wrong in a couple of months, but, you know, they're not, like, going to shift them. Like, Disney's not going to go away for a long time and neither DreamWorks. But, you know, going back to that particular point where DreamWorks did challenge Disney, they came out with Ants in 1998, which was, it's not a carbon copy. I, I will say this, it's not a carbon copy of A Bug's Life. It's not the exact same story. It's not people saying, oh, we got to fight against the grasshoppers and win. No, Ants is very violent, I will say. It was kind of like a counterculture thing where they were trying to do their spin on the fairy tale kind of retellings. You know, you've got Ants, you've got the Road to El Dorado especially. That was very fantastical in the way that they portrayed that. You know, we obviously had Shrek, which we'll touch on. But going back to the very beginning, I don't know. I remember seeing Ants, but I don't think I saw it in the cinema. I either saw it in VHS, which again, I'm aging myself there, or I must have seen it on TV and I just did not like it. Even today, I do not like Ants. I thought some of it's alright. You know, the animation doesn't hold up well and everything, so you kind of think with an entry like Ants. Neither does the stars, unfortunately. Oh, really? Well, Woody Allen. Oh, God, I forgot he was in that. (laughs) Yeah, he's like the main character. Oh, of course he is. Yeah, so you would think with Ants, that would, I wouldn't say kill the studio, but it's not exactly the strongest entry. But then, of course, in the same year, about two months, I can't believe that, actually, it's two months apart from Ants and the Prince of Egypt, which I think you were saying that they must have been working on this simultaneously, because the Prince of Egypt, even to this day, is one of my favourite films, and I know obviously, as you said, you're very fond of it. It is like night and day, as not Talk. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's completely different. Even just, like the, the animation style as well is very different. Like I was looking into that a little bit and they both do have a combination of hand-drawn and computer-generated animation. But I think the Ants one is much more Uncanny Valley, whereas Prince of Egypt seems to rely more on the 2D animation with like minimal 3D animation. I think the only 3D animation I can really think of is during the the, the plague scene with the fires are like raining down kind of thing and uh, maybe like the burning bush or something might be like CG animation because it was definitely a transitional period in animation I have to say the only film I can remember off the top of my head I think this was probably the first feature length and correct me if I'm wrong but was it not Toy Story that was like the first feature length 3D film animation 3D film I don't know that for a fact that that does seem right because I mean that is what Pixar Studios that's what they premiered with as a feature length film and I don't I, th- I think it was pretty extraordinary for the time period that it was it was created it looks a little bit rough now if you go back and watch it but it's still good it's still a good watch yeah I'm just double checking my notes here to make sure that I'm not <laughs> speaking out my, my DreamWorks whole year but yeah it seems to be like the first computer animated feature film it was not owned by Disney at that point though that is true I think it was owned by Apple at the time they really missed their trick there didn't they <laughs> oh then they, they, they sold Pixar to Disney uh, a yeah. l- little bit but, I mean they've not suffered too much so I don't think I don't think anyone will be crying over them that's why they have to sell the phones <laughs> Like, I could have been selling Woody merch, but no, I'm selling phones. But yeah, in 1995, November 1995, that was when the first computer generated animation film came out. And it is amazing to think, though, how far obviously animation's come since then. So, in a way, you can kind of let them off a wee bit with the way the animation developed. And the animation in these films definitely got a lot better. But yeah, going back to Ants, that was a rough start. I mean, The Bug's Life didn't 
look as like it looked better maybe not overly so but yeah then you get Prince of Egypt and that's more traditional hand-drawn animation and I think towards the early 2000s that's when they were starting to move towards you know more of a Pixar centric thing DreamWorks I think decided to copy that in a way but see without any further ado will we just jump in and talk about this journey both the journey of DreamWorks and our journey as fans of this particular studio yeah I think so let's hop into it and as we try to catch some I think it's skyfish like I don't know what that kid was trying to catch you know the DreamWorks oh uh, the moon yeah, child the moon child yeah I don't even know if he's got a name you know Mooney or something Ooh, I don't know. Or, or I'm gonna look that up during the ad break yeah please do <laughs> and as Andrew looks that up we will be right back after these messages welcome to Shatsunami a variety podcast that discusses topics from gaming and films to anime and general interests previously on Chatsunami, we've analysed what makes a good horror game conducted a retrospective on Pierce Brosnan's runs James Bond and listened to us take deep dives into both the Sonic and Halo franchises also if you're an anime fan then don't forget to check us out on our sub-series Chatsunani where we dive into the world of anime so far we've reviewed things like Death Note, Princess Mononoke, and the hit Beyblade series. If that sounds like your cup of tea, then you can check us out on Spotify, iTunes, and all good podcast apps. As always, stay safe, stay awesome, and most importantly, stay hydrated. Hey, I'm Abby. Hi, I'm Fee, and together we are the Everything Coincidental Podcast. We talk about all things paranormal, such as ghosties, cryptids, and aliens. We also like to talk about all things spirituality, which encourages us and others to live by their own rules. So if that's something that you relate to and are interested in, make sure you check us out at Everything Coincidental on all platforms and also drop us a message. We'd love to chat to you at some point about it. Talk soon. Bye. This episode is sponsored by Zencaster. If you're a podcaster that records remotely like me, then you'll know how challenging it can be to create the podcast you've always wanted. That's where Zencaster comes in. Before I met Zencaster, I was but a naive podcaster, recording on low quality, one track audio waves. <laughs> But with Zencaster, you can kiss those fears goodbye as they provide crystal clear audio and HD video. Plus, with our all-in-one podcasting suite, recording with guests is extremely simple. From local recordings to post-production, Zencaster has it all. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code CHATSUNAMI. You'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experience I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. So, Andrew, I've got to ask before we go into talking about the good, the bad, and the downright weird of this particular animation studio, is it safe to say that DreamWorks has played, in terms of the film side of your life, would you say it's played like a large part? I think so. I would say that as much as Disney, DreamWorks has played a crucial role in my kind of appreciation of anime and film. Kind of looking back at the film, my favourite films from DreamWorks, I would say that I've probably seen them as much much as I've seen Disney films. We'll get into some of our, our favorites in a little bit, but I would say that there's several films on here that kind of become kind of comfort films for me, more so even than many Disney films. And I absolutely adore Disney, particularly 90s Disney, as I've uh, said before. But some of these films just speak to me much more than even they do. So I think that often that the films in the list that we'll be talking about are very important to my development of, of me as a, as a person. I think that it was it shaped an element of who I am. DreamWorks is one of those animation studios that you kind of think, yeah, I've seen the odd film, you know, I've seen Shrek, I've seen, I don't know, Boss Baby on the back of a bus or something like that. But the more you think about it, like, especially for me, as I said, I knew about Ants. Again, wasn't a big fan. Then I saw Prince of Egypt because when I was younger, you know, I went to church and things and they talked about it and things like the Prince of Egypt being that. They didn't show it. I mean, I'm going to point that out. They didn't, like, show it in a big screen. This is cool. Cool guys. Youth pastor voice. You know someone else who had a real tough time? Moses. What was this? <laughs> Oh, those Egyptians. Yeah, those scallywags, which I, I know. One day we genuinely should do an episode on the Prince of Egypt because it is such a fascinating film. And see, as I get older, and I'm not saying that in the depressing way of, oh my God, I'm old, but the more I watch the Prince of Egypt, like I even showed it to my partner who, she hadn't seen it at all. And it was so, like, you know that way when you have a 
film you absolutely love and you show it to someone for the first time and you're saying oh this is happening because of this blah 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 it was honestly such a cool feeling you know seeing it through their eyes and obviously the music is great the animation is beautiful and then you go on about roughly just under two years later where we get the road to El Dorado and there's a long road ahead for DreamWorks and personally I like it I love the animation I love the songs and things and you know there's a lot that they start to branch out with it doesn't seem as if DreamWorks they didn't really stay quite stagnant like obviously they have a lot of either talking about historical events a bit like what the Anastasia film did with El Dorado and I'm not saying the road to El Dorado is historically accurate but you know it's based on the place and everything but then they branch off in the 2000s and they go to El Dorado and then the next film a couple of months later is and don't get me wrong I think it's more produced by them but it was Chicken Run which this is something I was saying to you as well but it's like actually really surprising how they produced a lot of Ardman and Nick Park films yeah they seem to have had like a distribution deal with Ardman Animation for a variety of films because you had the likes of Chicken Run you had the likes of Walter Cromit Curse of the Were Rabbit you had Flushed Away your favourite oh god yeah I, I love Flushed Away it's great and yeah there was I think there might be another one coming soon but I mean it, it, it's interesting because it wasn't like an exclusive deal like there have been another Walter and Gromit movie that came out not through DreamWorks I think it was that one about baking yeah I think because that was more through the BBC so it was like more of an episode yeah you're right it's more of an episode than a feature length film but yeah 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 so it's, it, seem, it seems like DreamWorks works with a variety of different animation studios including Ardman Animations and I don't know Ardman Animations kind of isn't exclusive to DreamWorks they'll work on uh, projects with other film studios it is an interesting one because I, I mean, I don't know this for a fact with, with Disney, but it does seem like um, Disney is a lot more like in-house in a lot of the work that they do, whereas DreamWorks tends to be a lot more like third party and working with other uh, animation studios to kind of create different looks. And you can tell based on a lot of their films, like which ones have certain looks for an Eldorado or a Spirit or a Sinbad. You have the DW Glendale Bardell Entertainment Studios kind of work on that 2D kind of look whereas for something like Shrek you have like Pacific Data who also worked on the Ants movie who also worked on Shark Tale and Madagascar these kind of these kind of films like there's certain studios they work with for certain looks and there are certain ones that I prefer more than others like I typically prefer the work from DW Glendale more so than Pacific Data but I mean that's not to say like they also work kind of together so like something like Shrek or um, Madagascar like DW Glendale worked with Pacific specific data so they kind of have a combination there and then i think dw glendale then kind of moved over into just doing kind of 3d animation after a while i guess maybe that was just kind of what was requested of them and kind of the the r of 2d died after that which to me is a big shame but i don't know what, what are your thoughts on that yeah there was definitely in terms of the landscape of animation and i'm not going to sit here and pretend like i'm an authority on animation or anything <laughs> i mean you've seen my stick figures andrew like they they really should be held in a museum or something for for what not to do in terms of drawing but yeah there was definitely a change and a shift from that kind of traditional animation to the 3D animation and I don't know if it's just because it was easier or as we were talking about before we had Pixar who were definitely dominating a lot more than the traditional side of Disney and I'm just having a look at some of the films that weren't received very well like for example one of your favourite films Andrew being Treasure Planet which is a really cool idea and everything but he's genuine and I obviously love Treasure Planet oh yeah sorry I forgot I said that before <laughs> yeah it's not like not like a flushed away yeah for legal reasons that was a joke before but yeah before I sue <laughs> defamation <laughs> looking at the red panda i been like please get me out of this place but I think that kind of flopped when it came out so then they still had animation films but I mean I'm, I'm gonna be honest like in terms of Disney and I know I'll bring it back to DreamWorks but you know you had Finding Nemo you had The Incredibles you had all of these relatively good Pixar films and don't get me wrong they did move on to like real guff like Chicken Little and things like that in between that you had Brother Bear which was okay and you had Home on the Range which was oh gee the, the less said about that the better god it was an awful film yeah if anybody wants to pay me either on Patreon or just in general to review that film I will but I will never do it for free because that film was oh that was horrific that film 
I think I watched that and I, not intentionally but I remember I ended up watching it in like a bootleg DVD once again it wasn't mine but I'm not saying it wasn't mine because it was a pirated DVD I'm saying that because I don't want to admit to ever owning Home on the Range <laughs> at all it was that bad I don't think I ever owned it but I think we must, must have rented it from like Blockbuster or something at some point because I'm pretty sure I did watch it in that capacity I don't even remember it it was awful but when you look at Home on the Range so Home on the Range and those kind of films were the kind of early 2000s like 2003 2004 but with DreamWorks from the year 2000 or even as far back as 1998 I mean their films are going strong you had The Prince of Egypt again in the 2000s you had Chicken Run you had Joseph King of Dreams which I'm going to be honest probably and I could be totally wrong in this there might be a lot of what do the cool kids say Joseph stands out there you know Bible Jojo yeah Bible Jojo exactly maybe there's fans out there but I don't remember personally people raving about this film in comparison to The Prince of Egypt but then of course in 2001 everything changed where we got Shrek which I know it's gone through the memes and it's gone through the it's ogre and everything but I mean I liked this film when it came out I'll tell you how old I am and again you'll probably relate to this but when I think it was the year after I remember getting two VHS tapes I think for Christmas and one of them was Shrek and the other was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and I remember watching them and just not burning them out I wasn't that big a fan of Shrek do you know what it reminds me of and this is me using a gaming analogy but it's almost as if like Disney were Nintendo and DreamWorks were like Sega because both companies wanted to be the complete opposite of the competitor they wanted to be oh look at us we're cool we're edgy and especially for Shrek because do you remember your first impressions of Shrek when it came out I don't exactly remember my first impressions but I do remember really enjoying it as a kid I don't know whether I saw the cinema it seems like I might have done but I'm pretty sure I did go to the cinema and see Shrek and I I was very intrigued by I thought I thought it was a a fun telling of this rude fantasy story that you hadn't really seen before and that was kind of something I was going to bring up with as well about DreamWorks that DreamWorks feels is very much like a this sent your daddy's Disney movie DreamWorks films tend to be a lot more risky they tend to have a lot more kind of rude jokes or violence in it there's a lot of like innuendos present in there and like Shrek I feel was kind of the start of that I think that there was kind of a, a real shift in the tone of DreamWorks films after that. You had elements of that through Chicken Run and... No, I, I tell a lie. Rotel Dorado had a lot more of those kind of things first. So the Rotel Dorado, I'd say, was a really big moment. And you kind of get the feeling that in the Rotel Dorado, and also there's an element of it in The Prince of Egypt, that there's a certain level of horniness to the creation of it where the girls were always created to be a lot sort of sexier than you would see in the likes of Disney movies. You did get certain elements of that with Hercules, with Megara, but you really amped up how these kind of female figures were portrayed in these movies and to an extent like in Road to El Dorado which I just watched yesterday I think very heavily implied that two of the characters have sex and like you would not ever get that in Disney even now I don't think there's been any kind of suggestion of that in Disney movies yeah because they keep killing off the parents in Disney films before it goes any further it's like oh you're a parent well who's it gonna be who's it gonna be the dad the mom that and also like typically in Disney movies the protagonists are quite young it would feel weird to have a scene like that whereas DreamWorks often aren't afraid to be like we don't need a child audience insert character we're able to have a funny story where all the characters are adults there are a few that have that like Mr. Peabody and Sherman has Sherman as like your audience insert child I mean you have midlife crisis films like Megamind which although that is like a kind of kid friendly film about this alien super villain and oh it's comedy and things see if you actually look at it from another perspective it's like it's quite obviously you know it's not the Citizen Kane of this kind of storytelling but it's quite hard hitting at times you know it's someone who wants to be better than themselves and they have an identity crisis of what they want to do but they're not good at X and they try to compensate in other ways and things it's for kids anyway the way they actually tell those stories you're completely right there's a lot more mature takes on the kind of storytelling that Disney uh, I was going 
to say perfected, but then they kind of lost their way as well. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going to suggest for one minute that DreamWorks didn't lose their way as well, because we are going to go on to that at some point. But sorry, before we go on, was there any others? There is a couple others, yeah. So I mean, uh, an obvious one is How to Train Your Dragon, that you have a young uh, main character there. You have Boss Baby. You have Rise of the Guardians to an extent. You have The Croods. And then there's a film called Home, which I never watched. So I don't really clear on what the situation is there but yeah those are the only ones that i think would also fit into that which when you have like a filmography spanning dozens and dozens of films being able to name on your hand the number of films where there is a audience insert child character pretty extraordinary pretty pretty rare for an animated film studio and again it's something that we talked about earlier but it's definitely interesting how diverse these stories are and these characters are because don't get me wrong although obviously disney does have different you know films and things there's a lot of kind of similar trades this kind of relates to the stereotype of the disney princess you know it's about a usually a young woman who wants more out of life and the only thing that really changes around her is the setting and everything but in these kind of films in particular there's definitely a conscious choice to almost reject that kind of idea like don't get me wrong it still has its tropes and stereotypes and things like that but I mean again especially with things like Shrek or you know any of the other countless films that came out after that they do make a conscious effort to try and well really just either poke fun at Disney poke fun at those kind of tropes or distance themselves and don't get me wrong I think the early years because I feel as if and I don't know what you think about this Andrew but I feel as if DreamWorks went through a very similar thing with Disney in the sense that their early years were really good, really strong. And then they had this kind of awkward middle period that was just awful, you know, and then they kind of picked themselves up a wee bit more towards the kind of 2010s. I don't know. I feel like DreamWorks is not, It's. I don't think there is necessarily a period of lull. I think there'll just be like a series of movies that are more of a lull. You can make an argument for some, and I, and a lot of it's subjective. For example, they start off with Ants, which I don't think was a very good movie, so poor start. Then they have Prince of Egypt and El Dorado and Chicken Run, all great. Joseph King of Dreams, from what we watched of it, we didn't see it all, was rubbish. Then you had Shrek, Spirit of Style and Cimarron, Sinbad, Shrek 2, all great. Shark Tale and Madagascar, whilst I enjoyed them at the time, they don't age that well, I don't think. Madagascar more so, but Shark Tale I think is rubbish now, when I rewatched it. I don't think even at the time Shark Tale was going to age gracefully. <laughs> I mean, whoever thought in that studio, they turned around and they said, so you know that mocap thing? technology that they've got going on. Yeah, what, what if he use Will Smith's face and slap it on a fish? And someone had to green like that. Yeah. And, you know, say, let's go ahead with Will Smith's face on a fish. But sorry. <laughs> sorry for reintroducing a lot of nightmares for the lovely listeners at home there. No, I think I think that, that, that's probably okay. We have, like, Walsh and Gromit Curse of the Were-Rabbit, which I personally was not a big fan of. Walsh and Gromit, for me, I kind of go back and forth on, on my enjoyment of it. It was very quickly well-received, Curse of the Were-Rabbit, and there were certainly elements that I liked, but I find it quite kind of a boring film to be honest i totally agree with that i think that it's too long and i know that sounds weird but the way that the old walls and gromit shorts worked i think they were about maybe 30 to 45 minutes that sounds about right yeah they weren't like you know feature length films so when they had the first feature length film you're like "Uh, it's okay and everything it it had interesting ideas but just i don't think it worked personally i think the one that came after that a matter of loaf and death was absolutely brilliant but again it's like trying to yeah fit that into the mould of a feature length film which don't worry that'll be for Wallace and Gromit month (laughs) (laughs) that'd be a fun one to do actually yeah then we have Over the Hedge which I actually watched again recently for the first time after like probably about 10 plus years of not having seen it it's a fun movie like it works there's elements of it that's that's quite quite good Flushed Away as I already said I despise that movie I thought it was dreadful Shrek the Third was where like it was a real kind of negative turn on the Shrek movies after the first two are very fun. I really don't like Shrek the Third. I don't know what your what were your thoughts on that one. Oh I hate it. I actually think this is horrific because and again I know we'll get on to Shrek as the Shrek goes forth. The fourth Shrek film. Yeah. The first two, like I love the first film, although some animation elements haven't, you know, aged well, I still think it's a good film. And I think it's just such a great touchstone of the time of animation and things. 
things like that. And mm. I know it's a meme to hell and back now, so it's kind of hard to look at it in a serious way without people going, oh, it's all Wogar now. I don't think it was ever meant to be uh, reviewed in a serious way, to be fun, to be honest, though. No, no. It's a children's animation. <laughs> if I put on my anime glasses here, I was like, well, actually, the significance of Shrek. But, you know, at the same time, it was like the kind of counter Disney film. Same with Shrek, too. And both of them are very entertaining films. They're, like, great to watch. But then you get to Shrek the third, and it just becomes a parody of itself. It almost feels like one long SNL sketch, where it's just like, oh, look, he goes to high school and everything, and oh, it's so funny because they're taking Murr and a, oh, God, like some weed reference and a carriage or something. You know, it's just, it's not good. It's just, it's not yeah. a good film at all. But yeah, no, totally agree. We then move on to B movie, which, speaking of memes, is uh, is interesting itself. I'm kind of all over the place about B movie because there are elements of it that is, it's, it's quite fun. Like, it's a cute idea. That some of the jokes are quite fun, but as a whole, it's not a good movie. You have clearly not answered one very important question here, which is do you like jazz? Take it or leave it. <laughs> So sorry, you were saying. Yeah, so we then go on to Kung Fu Panda, which I know is a personal favourite of yours and uh, is something that I really enjoy as well, where we kind of have another start of a franchise. Here we've, we've had the um, Drek films kind of have uh, two and three already, and we've had the first of both Madagascar, and now we're kind of moving on to the, kind of the Kung Fu Panda series, which I understand the fourth one's actually coming out in the near future, so there's going to be four of those ones. And Kung Fu Panda 1 and Kung Fu Panda 2, I really enjoy. I, I think both of them are fantastic i have not seen the third one so i can't discuss that one but i would happily put just from the first two i'd happily put that in my like, like top 10 dreamworks films i think it's it's wonderful i would completely echo that kung fu panda is one of these like surprise favorites for me because the way i actually was introduced to this film like i heard about kung fu panda but i think i was just at that age where i was like oh, okay kung fu panda oh, look it's a fighting panda oh you know i was an edgy teenager what can i say you know, I wasn't really into it. I was like, oh, okay, great, Kung Fu Panda. So I remember for some reason, and th- this is genuinely true, for one year, I think it was either for my birthday or for Christmas, I had got a, and I don't know if you remember this model, Andrew, but do you remember the old iPod? I think it was Nanos. Yes, I do I do remember the Nano. So they had the small screen. So anyone who doesn't know, they had that and they had the scroll wheel. So mm-hmm. it's like you couldn't like go up and down with it. You had to like scroll your finger around the circle and then press the middle button to confirm. It was like a rotary phone Walkman. (laughs) That's exactly what it was. Yeah, but they had it in all different colours and at the time you know, oh this was cutting edge technology this was great. And I remember I think my brother had got the film on the iPod and I remember watching it thinking oh right, Kung Fu Panda, I wonder what, you know, this is going to be about. And I absolutely fell in love with it. It was just such a shock about how good this film was. Because a lot of people say that they go, oh Kung Fu Panda, you know how is that a good film and you know you watch it and they tackle a lot of very serious themes about like identity and belonging and trying to better yourself it is actually a really good film i would go as far to say this is probably my favorite trilogy of dreamworks as a whole shrek the first two shreks are good i will say this the first two shreks are really good but then three and four just let it down if the third one was good or the fourth one was a bit better then I would probably put it up there but the second one as well I know we'll get onto it but the second one is absolutely fantastic as well and I actually watched the third one the other day it's not as good as the other two but you know what for what it is it's like really again it's interesting the animation's beautiful and I've never really felt disappointed with these kind of films I would wholeheartedly say this is one of the best films and it only gets better from there because I think two years later I think we get the How to Train Your Dragon series. Yes. Between Kung Fu Panda and then we have the second Madagascar movie, which is dreadful, and Monsters vs. Aliens, which I loved at the time. And my partner still really likes Monsters vs. Aliens, as, as far as I'm aware. But re-watching it more recently, I realized like that's it's not a good movie. But then we do get How to Train Your Dragon, which How to Train Your Dragon is very important to me for many, many reasons. It was the moment, I think, where I truly appreciated animation. That I was able to kind of distinguish like, wow, Wow, this looks beautiful. And when you look at it in comparison to more modern films of its type, you kind of like, oh, it's, it looks a bit awkward now. Like if you look at it compared to even the second or third, Hadrian Dragon and other movies that later came out, it does look a little bit awkward in its animation. 
But at the time, it was so beautiful that I just was completely blown away with it. It's also very important to me because it was the icebreaker I had with my current partner for us to like the first conversation we ever had was about how to train a dragon i knew she enjoyed animated movies and so i proposed the question of oh, okay so like what kind of anime movies do you like are you like a how to train a dragon person or like a minions kind of person what a question sorry <laughs> well I, w- I wanted to try and kind of find out what the bar was there and she immediately responded to me saying like oh my god how to train a dragon is my absolute favorite movie i love it so much if i suggested any other movie it might not have progressed the conversation in, in a way where to where we are now but that movie is what was partly responsible for the relationship we have now and so i'm so grateful for it for how wonderful of a movie it was and by fate it kind of bringing me and my partner together so it, it's it holds a very kind of special place for me and for my partner i can just imagine if he had suggested shrek though i don't think it would have had the same emotional resonance <laughs> <have> to say. <laughs> yeah i might have struggled to kind of keep the conversation going if that was the case well i mean that and trying to hide rings within onions yeah exactly <laughs> i was crying because of the onions but actually speaking of onions and apologies that wasn't an intentional segue by the way first of all sorry that was a beautiful story after that we get a less than beautiful story with shrek forever after which in fact i've actually got a funny well not funny sorry a story about this and i think it was probably just shy i think it was just a couple of weeks after my 18th birthday and long story short i was very violent ill. Not because of Shrek or anything, but I was violently ill coming back from holiday. I wouldn't have blamed you. I was just lying in bed being like, oh god. And my brother very nicely said, oh, we should go to the IMAX and go see a film when I was better. And like a couple of days later, after I was feeling a bit better, we actually went to see Shrek Forever After. And don't get me wrong, I don't think it's the best in the quadrilogy of Shrek films, but because of that reason, I've got like a very soft spot for that film, because Mm -hmm. that was a film that we went to see and you know it kind of felt a bit better and everything and again it's like it's not the best film but I feel as if it's a decent enough conclusion but then again they're bringing out like a fifth Shrek or a Shrek reboot or something which I know we'll get on to in a minute but, but what were your thoughts? I'm not confident I ever actually watched the fourth Shrek film all the way through I've seen bits of it I kind of know the story of it I know that like Stiltskin makes it so that Shrek doesn't exist like a world where Shrek doesn't exist or something and and there's a whole like badass ogre legion led by Fiona and that's kind of like all I really know about it. Yeah, I think that's all you really need to know about yeah. it, to be honest. Although, funny enough, this is me brushing up my Shrek lore here, but apparently I think it's the third film or it's one of the other films where they actually introduce Rumpelstiltskin, but not as the character he would be in Shrek Forever After. It's like some random guy who's just like, oh hey, I'm Rumpelstiltskin. Nah, I hope someone got fired for that blunder. I was about to Oh, yeah. <laughs> I sure hope, hope so. someone got fired for that blunder. <laughs> But speaking of Mega Minds, clever segue. Yeah, the next film after that was actually Mega Minds. Yeah, and an, an, an interesting one. It came out around the same time, or very at least a very similar time to Illuminations Despicable Me, which both films kind of focus on like the bad guy redeeming himself and becoming it was more like more of like an anti hero, I guess. And so it was it was interesting kind of seeing the reception to both of those. The Despicable Me kind of got a lot more attention. It was much more of a box office success than Mega Mind. But of the two, I'd say I prefer for Megamind. Yeah, that's actually a good point that Megamind and Despicable Me are both about supervillains, which I never actually made the connection until there. It's like I'm a mental moment. I'm like, oh my god. I mean, they're both obviously different. Like, Megamind is more fantastical in their elements. You know, it's more like the Supermans versus aliens and kind of things like that, whereas Despicable Me, I've still got a soft spot for Despicable Me. I really like Despicable Me, but yeah, I feel as if Megamind's really underrated. To be fair. Like, I, I don't think... I mean, you and I, of course, we had a mutual friend in university that we try, Or rather, you tried to show this film to, and I don't think he was really into it, was he? No, he didn't seem to like it very much. There was that and something else we tried to show him, and he just didn't like either of them. Yeah, Attack on Titan. That was the other one. Because he was like, this is terrifying. I think he was a bit drunk at the time. But... Yeah, he, he had been drinking, which probably didn't help the situation of Attack on Titan. But yeah, he, he didn't seem to be a fan of Megamind, unfortunately. Yeah, which is a shame, because it does 
does have a lot of like funny jokes and everything and it's not again it's not maybe the best of DreamWorks but it's certainly not the worst it's mm-hmm. certainly above Shark Tale for God's sake and <laughs> things like that yeah oh I just remembered something I was going to say just about How to Train Your Dragon quickly that it came out around the same time that Toy Story 3 did and Toy Story 3 won the best animated picture at the Oscars that year and I was so mad because I, that was like one of the first times I felt like a real like, injustice had been made there because like it was something I was like invested in that the film that I knew was incredible so good and, like Toy Story 3 is a fun film but I thought that How to Train Your Dragon was a much more interesting film so I was annoyed when that happened well funny enough I think they're making a Toy Story 5 now yeah I don't know where they're gonna go with that to be honest I say that as I'm like oh they're making you know as you said oh they're making a Kung Fu Panda 4 and a Shrek reboot and things and yeah but speaking of like Kung Fu Panda again yeah you've got Kung Fu Panda 2 which came out in 2011 and then another film which I'm quite curious to hear if you've watched it that of course being Puss in Boots so I've not seen the first Puss in Boots but I have seen the most recent one so I, I looked I looked into this a little bit because I was like oh do I need to watch the first one before I watch the second one and I found out that I don't and I found out that the first Puss in Boots movie is like a prequel to the Shrek films where Whereas the most recent one, The Last Wish, which was nominated for, for an Oscar, and I personally think it probably should have won said Oscar, that took place after the events of the Shrek films that have thus far come out. So they're very much like separated in their in their stories. And I didn't really hear much good about Puss in Boots in the I didn't really hear anything yeah. about it. like I haven't heard good or bad, which is often much worse that just no one talked about it. I actually did watch Puss in Boots like a couple of months ago. I think it was because The Last Wish was coming out and this was free on UK Netflix. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, free quotation marks. But I was like, oh, okay. I'll check it out, see how bad it is because I've heard bad things about it. But I thought, surely it can't be that bad. And it's okay. Ironically enough, I haven't seen The Last Wish yet, but I have heard amazing things about that. It does seem as if they are going in a very particular direction and I'm really happy for them but for Puss in Boots it is literally just Puss in Boots going back and discovering his roots with the Humpty Dumpty of all people. I'm going to be honest see the next couple of films they are not that memorable. I mean you've got Madagascar 3, you've got Rise of the Guardians which I have to say Rise of the Guardians seems to have like a cult following. I quite like it and my partner really likes it partly because she has a bit of a crush on the main character. That seems to be the the consensus yeah and like it's a decent film to be honest and it's based on a book series which i actually have a bunch of because i was quite interested in kind of learning more i haven't dived into that yet but yeah it was a book series by william joyce which this film is based off of and so it seems like an interesting kind of world that i'd quite like to kind of explore more but i do understand some people not finding it particularly interesting because when it first came out i wasn't really interested in it which again we then have a bit of a, a couple of poopers for me i'd say in the crudes and turbo i had no interest in turbo and i've seen bits of the crudes and just didn't really enjoy it so I can't really give much thought to that. Have you seen either of these films? All I know is Nicolas Cage apparently was in the crudes and the only reason I know that is because I watched the recent Nicolas Cage film, you know the one where he plays himself. There's like these two CIA agents who recognise him as Nicolas Cage and one of them recognises him as the guy from the crudes <laughs> and he's like <laughs> and the other guy's like the crudes? Of course I've not seen the crudes, I'm like 40 years old, I recognise him from Con Air <laughs> it's like, that was quite funny that's good I want to watch that film yeah oh it's so good and then we have a film that you and I watched together I remember us enjoying it was Mr. Peabody and Sherman that was a fun one I have not included my top 10 DreamWorks films but I didn't I, I was kind of back and forth on that and another one in my top 10 I did kind of just kind of condense series so I wouldn't have to list each one individually which then brings us on to How to Train Dragon 2 which is gorgeous it is a beautiful film it's a film that makes you cry it's a film that is interesting in its in its story and like it's expanding its previously kind of established universe the music score as we haven't really touched on that we will a little bit more later but the music score by John Powell is brilliant I think that they, they managed to take what was was so fun and interesting and beautiful about the first film and managed to expand on it in the second one so that was really really impressive I really enjoyed that and then we followed that up sorry have you seen How to Train Dragon 2? Yeah well bits and pieces I do need to like sit down and just watch them all through I'll, I'll probably include it in DreamWorks month when we get round to it because I mean there's so much we could talk about but How to Train Your Dragon there's definitely a series that I do agree it does deserve to be talked about because I know I kind of didn't touch on it very much before 
before, but with films like Kung Fu Panda, the animation does get a lot better, and I feel as if the best animation in particular is with the second one as well, funny enough, but it just it springboards from something like Kung Fu Panda onto How to Train Your Dragon, and the How to Train Your Dragon series, I completely agree, it does look absolutely gorgeous when you've got those sweeping shots of them going over the ocean and things like that, so no, I completely agree with you there. It is like a very visually stunning film, on top of being a good film overall. We're then back on track with a couple more disappointing ones. I say that, again, I have not seen either of these two films. Penguins of Madagascar and Home. Have you seen either of these films? No. And I'm going to be honest, I am not a big fan of the Penguins of Madagascar. No. I have relatives who decided that the height of comedy was to quote the smile and wave. You know, when they say smile and wave, boys, smile and wave. I was guilty of quoting that when I was younger as well. It's okay when you quote it once or twice, you know, but this was constant. This was like a constant stream. So, you know, in games like Black Ops where they've got the conditioning that sends their brain back to a time where they're like oh my god what's going on yeah that's my trigger phrase that's me going oh my god (laughs) I don't want to go back. You're the Manchurian candidate from Penguins of Madagascar. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to go back and watch it. Yeah, I, I'm going to be honest. So I haven't seen it, and I haven't seen Home. I've heard okay things about them. I've heard nothing about Home. I just know Rihanna's in it, and the guy that plays Sheldon, whose name I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, I, I think that's kind of the pinnacle of an okay film. You know, if you don't hear anything about it, it's like it's not bad because people would be moaning about it, but neither is it good. Yeah. I mean, after that, you get Kung Fu Panda 3, which, as far as I know, was received well. And again, I've only watched that recently, and I liked it. thought it was a great film, but... I still have to watch it. I've not seen it. I would recommend it. It is actually a lot of fun. But then after that, though, we've got Trolls. I've actually seen Trolls. I watched it last summer because my nieces really love it, and so they had it on. And so like that was my first experience of it, and it was... It was okay. It was just kind of one of those young kid kind of movies. It's kind of like like everything's filled with songs and modern pop songs, or say modern, just general kind of pop songs. Yeah, because it's Justin Timberlake, I think. Is he not like the main troll? Yeah, maybe Justin Timberlake and Anna Kendrick, maybe? Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, it's a strange mix, but I remember the song. Oh god, I can't remember the name of it, but I can remember the actual melody for it, where it's like, you know, the main song in Trolls that they sing when they free everyone? I don't remember to be honest. It's just because I remember at the time I'd started a new job and I was in like this room where they had the radio on constantly and that song was like on every single hour and I was like oh my god it's a good song but after like the fifth time of hearing it in the day you're like okay this is is getting ridiculous (laughs) stop it. But after that though speaking of ridiculous you've got The Boss Baby (sighs) Yeah I've seen it now I've watched it in its entirety it's not as bad as you'd think it'd be, but it's not a good movie. I did not enjoy watching it. I will not watch it again. It's like a retail one of the Rugrats, but not as endearing. Not sure about that, but... I, I, yeah, I, I, I know. I know that's an insult to Rugrats, but it's okay. Yeah, it's another one of these films that... It's a film that, and again, I don't want really to say this like for Boss Baby, but it's a film that just won't go away. You know, it's one of these films that, although it happened, you think, haha, Boss Baby, whatever will they think of next? And then they bring out a sequel and like spin-off shows is okay. But I mean then the next couple you've got Captain Underpants which I have to say no same I've got no attachment. I knew about Captain Underpants growing up but I was of the age to be reading Captain Underpants but it just never interested me and so like I don't have that kind of nostalgia for it enough to watch that. But yeah we we then move on to the third and final How to Train Your Dragon movie which it's not as good as the first two I would say but it does wrap up the story nicely and and there were many tears in the theater when uh, I went to see it with my partner, her sister, and generally in, in the theater, there were just lots of tears being shed just because of how important the franchise was to my partner and I and and also her sister, for her sister for different reasons. We were all an absolute mess coming out and my partner works with children and happened to be some of the children she works with in the cinema and so they just like turned towards the end when the lights went up and just, they saw my partner just absolutely bawling with tears. Yeah, no, I can, I can see that though. But 
Is he after that, though? This, yeah. Just sorry, just jumping in. That This seems to be the worst turn for, for DreamWorks. Well, I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. The Crudes, A New Age was just like a... That, that was a cinematic masterpiece, yeah. yeah. But yeah, going back, you've got, yeah, Abominable, Trolls World Tour, The Crudes again, and Spirit Untamed, and The Boss Baby. I'm going to be honest, I have seen none of these, and I don't know whether they're decent. They probably are decent enough, but I mean, have you seen any of them? No, it's been they're untamed. I watched a bit of the TV series. I watched like the first episode and it was really awful and like it wasn't the same spirit as the original movie. So I'm not going to really invest myself in this. So I didn't even know a movie had come out, to be honest. But yeah, I was very, very underwhelmed by that one. But the final two of the most recent DreamWorks films to have come out, The Bad Guys and Puss in Boots The Last Wish. I have seen both of these films. I watched The Bad Guys actually on a plane journey and then Puss in Boots I watched recently in kind of the build up to the Oscars. The Bad Guys is a good movie. I think it, honestly it's a fun movie. It's it's not dissimilar to a mega mind kind of thing of you're sort of seeing someone who's always thought of and traditionally was like the villain having like kind of a, a turn and sort of becoming that that hero character. It's done in a fun kind of way where the world is kind of a hybrid of humans and, and animals that kind of interact with each other and like the bad guys are all just different animals. It's a fun movie and I recommend checking it out if you've not seen it. Have you have you watched that one? No, but I have heard a lot about it. There's is something I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the shift in animation style because I feel as if and you'll be able to be more of an authority than I am on this but I feel as if the bad guys and the last wish seem to be animated quite similar just the way they move and everything and I feel as if you know from a technical level you know I don't know if there is differences and I'm gonna get animation students kicking down my door tonight but I do feel as if it's a very similar way that they're probably going to adopt that style moving forward. Obviously not for everything, but it does seem quite interesting that's the way they're going with it. Yeah, it's, it's very it's very reminiscent of Sony Pictures sort of animation style when you saw Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. More so Puss in Boots, I'd say, than The Bad Guys, but The Bad Guys does have that kind of kind of look to it. It's very interesting how they're animated. More so, again, Puss in Boots. I think the animation is gorgeous. And it's not it's not like they brought in like a new animation studio to work on these films films like it's still dwa greendale working on puss and boots and the kind of a combination of dw greendale and jellyfish pictures who jellyfish pictures is kind of a more recent studio that they started working with uh, as well and so kind of a combination of dw greendale and jellyfish pictures working on these movies so i guess that may be the influence that this new studio jellyfish pictures is having an influence but puss and boots was not done by them so it's curious why they kind of taken that stance of moving into that style of animation i'm not complaining i'd be interested to see more done in that kind of style because I think it is very, very beautiful. So I'm, I'm interested to see where we go from here with that. I do recommend both those films to watch just to kind of round out the DreamWorks movies. I feel as if you could characterise DreamWorks overall, and this is kind of as a summary point here, but I feel as if you could characterise DreamWorks as the don't judge a book by its cover company in the sense that there's a lot of films that they produce and you would think, oh, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda, Shrek, or these don't look good at all and then by the time you get to the end of them especially with I know I keep going back to Puss in Boots but especially for that because so many people are raving about it and saying oh it's a fantastic film and it's weird to see that because especially with as I said Shrek is very much a massive meme at this point you know everybody knows the lines they've put the shit posts online and everything so you think well how can this be any better than you know what's preceded it and the fact that it's got such critical acclaim, so much so that it got nominated for the Oscars, for goodness sake, next to another film that you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, The Sea Beast. But the fact that that was getting nominated, and the fact that there's a lot of films that I would go as far to say are practically classics, like children's classics, that people still look back on today and think fond memories of. You know, like I, I wouldn't say maybe to the same extent as Disney. I feel as if Disney Disney still has their talents over childhood and memories and things like that. But no, I definitely think that they are definitely a don't judge a book by its cover company. But at the same time, there are a couple that do fall flat. Like as we were saying, the turbos and the, oh God, the shark tales. But going back to yourself though, how would you summarise DreamWorks as a company, you know, from a viewer perspective? I think they are an animation studio that is 
much more willing to take chances, take risks than Disney is. I think they kind of are often trailblazers in animation. The 3D animation that we saw in Shrek, in Shark Tale even, and then kind of progressing into kind of later movies is a variation of it is kind of the standard now within Disney animation and this animation at large. The success of those films was almost a nail in the coffin of traditional 2D animation. And so I think they're very influential in the animation world for that. You kind of saw a huge impact from films like How to Train a Dragon in how other studios were presenting their, their animation. In addition to that, like what we've not really touched much on is music. Disney is very well known for their beautiful music scores, particularly I would say more so with songs. I think there are some wonderful scores in Disney of just kind of like orchestral background music. But in my opinion, I think the DreamWorks often has them beat. They have their go-tos. DreamWorks, they have Hans Zimmer, John Powell, and Harry Gregson Williams, the three, either on their own or kind of a combination of them working together. And then in, in like the early days of DreamWorks, you had kind of guest songwriters, composers kind of working working with them, like Stephen Schwartz, who is best known for sort of writing a lot of the music and Wicked, wrote the music for Prince of Egypt. And you had uh, Elton John working working on Rotel Dorado, and you had Brian Adams working on Spirit. But for the most part, you don't really have much songwriting in DreamWorks movies. It's mostly just about like the score behind it, behind the movie. And the work of John Powell did on How to Train a Dragon is gorgeous. You had uh, John Powell also working on, on Chicken Run, which had some wonderful Great Escape inspired music. You had some great East Asian inspired music with Hans Zimmer and John Powell in the Kung Fu Panda films. And I think it's just a wonderful music score that you're getting from these movies. No. I completely agree with you. I sound like a broken record to you, but genuinely, the music is absolutely beautiful in these films. And it is amazing how much talent is behind them. Again, I I know I'm saying that when people like Jeffrey Katzenberg and uh, Steven Spielberg, especially, they are like some of the minds behind the initial inception of DreamWorks. But the fact that they've got so many people, like as you said, John Powell, Hans Zimmer, even Elton John, because I remember a couple of years ago, re-watching the Rotel Dorado in fact I think it might have been during the 2020 lockdowns and oh my goodness I, I just remember listening to the music and not watching it for years and I was like oh huh, that sounds an awful lot like Elton John and then I was like oh my god that is Elton John <laughs> completely agree. The music, although obviously, you know, there's some exceptions, like when they overuse the pop songs and things like that, especially with Shrek. Some of it's good, like the second film, you know, you've got your I Need a Hero and things, but that's more lifting it from pop culture and pop songs. It's not the original music, but you're completely right. Like the music for How to Train Your Dragon, Eastern influence music for Kung Fu Panda, you know, it's just, it's so beautiful. I know there's is there one particular song you like in Spirit, if I'm remembering correctly? There are many songs I love in Spirit. I'm a big fan of Brian Adams' music in Spirit, but Get Off of My Back, which is the moment in the film where these cowboys are trying to tame the horse and make it sort of able to ride and it keeps kicking them off, essentially. That is such a fun song, but you also have some absolutely brilliant ones. You have things like Here I Am, which was the kind of theme song for the film, which was kind of written by Brian Adams, Gretchen Peter and and Hans Zimmer together is so so just beautiful like it's really really interesting and there's a couple of songs which I think are stronger than others but honestly that film's soundtrack is so so good that I purchased it I thought it was absolutely wonderful that I had to have it I didn't really get too much into it but that is one of my main comfort DreamWorks movies referenced a little bit earlier that I have these kind of comfort DreamWorks films whenever I'm feeling not very well Spirit is one of the main films I'll put on just as like a relaxing kind of film that I'm so familiar with there's no lines of dialogue or other there's not very many lines of dialogue and they're able to kind of represent so much with with so little dialogue, which I thought was so interesting. What was sad that I saw was that it was very poorly received critically and like it was absolutely a box office bomb. So it's interesting then that they had these like spirit untamed and all these other things like 20 years later almost considering it was not very well received but it's one of my absolute favorites one more film that i feel would be criminal to actually miss before we wrap up is the prince of egypt the score in that is i would probably put it on top just purely because and again you were saying you know the songs were written or influenced anyway or they were worked on by stephen schwartz so it's very much a musical feel you 
you know, the whole thing is a musical because you've got the dialogue and then you've got the big bombastic songs. You've got the plague song. You're playing with the big boys now, as you said. When you believe, you've just got so many beautiful and emotional songs. Bringing in Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey for When You Believe was oh, yeah. was just wonderful. It's such a beautiful, beautiful song. We definitely need to do an episode on The Prince of Egypt. I know I've said that before, but it is such an emotive film and it's just everything slots into place perfectly and it just shows how competent DreamWorks can be you know with the music with the animation with well they got the celebrities that's all I'll say <laughs> most of them do a good job but there's one or two you can be like oh yeah it's Jeff Goldblum is one of the slaves all right okay jokes aside no offense to Jeff Goldblum for legal reasons that's a joke I swear to god yeah no it is absolutely beautiful and I do think that this is something I was saying this will be my final point but I do believe that when DreamWorks get it right, they get it right, you know, with the Prince of Egypt, with Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon. When they get these right, they knock it out of the park. They are some of the best that could rival or even surpass Disney. But like many other animation studios, absolutely, especially with Disney, Disney have their bunch of stinkers. But I mean, especially with Disney, you know, you've got these films that probably don't live up to the reputation. You know, you've got your boss babies, your Crudes, your, I don't know, homes, your shark tales, as I said before, you know, but what are your final thoughts though? Yeah, I think DreamWorks has a more of a mix, I'd say, of good films than Disney does. I think Disney is more consistent generally in its film quality, but DreamWorks has some films that just knock out of the park so well that it rises to be on par for me with Disney. Yeah, and that is like quite a weird thing to think about because obviously you and I grew up with the I mean, not seeing it in cinemas for some of them, but with the Disney Renaissance films that had come out and moving on to like the early 2000s films and the fact that a company, not that it came out of nowhere, because obviously Jeffrey Katzenberg did work for Disney initially and then he moved on to DreamWorks and established basically a whole legacy of these absolutely amazing animated films, whether they were produced through DreamWorks, whether they were made through them. I feel as if he's done a fantastic job but yeah no I see what you mean it'll be interesting to see where they go from here especially with like Puss and Boots whether they're going to go the Disney route and bank on nostalgia I know they're obviously not going to go for the Prince of Egypt like the Princes of Egypt this time it's personal have you read what happens to Moses after that film ends uh, he walks for 40 days oh sorry 40 years no even before that so after I watch this film you know it's a very spoiler for this over 2,000 year old story but I remember after the film finishes it finishes with Moses coming out and he's holding the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them and then it cuts to black and it's the Deliverer song which is beautiful fantastic and it cuts to black and I went wow that's amazing what a great film what happened next? He has a strop yeah so it turns out that Moses went away he chipped away at the Ten Commandments he like made them out and then when he came back back i think the jewish people who came with them got so restless that they decided to build a i think it was like a golden calf or something like that why i don't know like it was something to do with oh they wanted crops or something you know they wanted wealth and fertility and, you know they were desperate and obviously they were in the middle of the desert so he came out and he looks at these guys and he's like what the bloody hell are you doing and he actually smashes the tablets to the extent that he has to go up again and chip a bunch of new tablets so it's like, huh, probably good that they ended the film there. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, you don't want to end it with him being all stroppy. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That would be a bit of a downer, to be fair. But then again, there's a lot of down moments in that film. And in that book. Well, yeah, true. Yeah, spoilers. Yeah, before we end the episode, first of all, Andrew, thank you so much for talking about this particular studio and, yeah, wax and lyrical about your nostalgic memories on this. Oh, thank you for having me. I was really, really looking forward to chatting about this and it was a uh good uh, discussion that we had hopefully we'll be able to talk some more about DreamWorks films in more depth and maybe we'll do like a tier list or something sometime but as we go away and definitely prepare for that episode where can the lovely listeners at home find your particular content oh I thought you'd never ask you can find me on Twitter at GreenShield95 I do have a Twitch channel also GreenShield95 I don't really use it much though so you can mostly just find me here on uh, the Chat Tsunami podcast and also you'll be able to soon find us 
hopefully on the let's play channel which we'll be working on pretty soon so yeah if you haven't checked out our twitter at chats and amipod we have indeed launched a new let's play channel called chats who plays where you'll be able to see andrew and i and adam and really a lot of friends of the channel go through certain games and yeah we will be getting into a lot of hijinks so keep your eyes peeled for any future episodes there if you want to check out our other episodes on chats and Ami, you can check us out on of course all good podcast apps but you can also check us out on our website podpage.com forward slash chats and Ami, and we will see you there last but not least we of course have to thank our wonderful patrons robotic battles host and sonia thank you so much for supporting the channel but if you would like to become a pandalorian patron then you can join up at patreon.com forward slash chats and Ami, and yeah you'll be able to get some really cool exclusive content but until then thank you all so so much for listening as always stay safe stay awesome and most importantly stay Stay hydrated. hydrated